feel like I'm watching a tennis match. <laughs> but we'll, we'll try to avoid any conflict. If I have a stiff neck when I'm done, I, I will blame you. But otherwise, I, I'm grateful to be here, and I appreciate your attention. Good afternoon to all of you. Again, as Lori said, my name is John Meadows, and I'm an attorney with Steptoe & Johnson. My practice is in Charleston, West Virginia. And I am an energy litigator like Lori. And like Lori, the majority of my cases uh, in my career have involved many disputes between uh, surface owners and mineral owners. And today I'd like to discuss selected issues with respect to horizontal drilling. There are many issues that we can talk about. I've tried to restrict it to some that I think are, first of all, pertinent in North Dakota and also pertinent to where we stand uh, today in the art, uh, this, the current state of the law with respect to this. I, Lori did a fantastic job of explaining the difference between horizontal and vertical drilling, and I won't belabor the point. This graphic again shows you well B is a traditional vertical well. It's been drilled into the production level, and well A there has made a 90-degree turn at the production level and is now prospecting minerals from a much longer point of view. Uh, historically, under the law, if you were just drilling a regular vertical well and you happen to own B, and we didn't have horizontal drilling, but your next door neighbor who happened to own his mineral estate didn't like the fact that you'd stuck a straw into the common cup, he had relief. He could drill his own well and put his own straw into the common cup, and both of you would suck up those minerals as fast as possible. And that was the, the common relief to the problem of how do I handle the fact that my neighbor is more enterprising than I and is drinking all the minerals out of our common pool. Things are complicated with horizontal drilling because we have to send these legs out many miles in time, uh, at times. And it complicates matters because we're passing not under the estate that we are directly below. In addition, I, I wanted you to see this graphic. Uh, there's been a lot of misconceptions, especially in the industry and especially with respect to surface owners. Surface owners are told, I'm going to come and I'm going to drill a well. And a lot of them have experience with what that means, with what their conception is of what that'll look like. And they think I'm going to have a wellhead and I might have a brine tank or an oil water separator or a couple of pieces of equipment. And then they learn that not only after I've had the rig out there drilling, but for some period of time, if I'm going to be doing uh, hydro, hydro fracking and, and my horizontal legs, I'm going to have all of these various pieces of equipment operating. You see many of them are shown as being attached to tractor trailers, so that means this equipment's going to be moving in and out. Companies now can bring in the equipment to a particular wellhead that they need and move it to another one. So that's a lot more use of the surface in terms of ingress and egress. Things that just didn't occur to people when we had a vertical well, which could essentially be set in place, and for the most part, uh, farmers could grow crops around them uh, to the extent it didn't interfere with irrigation, and that's a, a separate set of case law. But the, the three issues that I'd like to focus uh, today and discuss with you are really the, the notion of common law trespass with respect to horizontal drilling, uh, some permitting issues, and then finally some interesting and North Dakota pertinent uh, law with respect to disposal. Uh, again, this is another graphic which gives you an idea of what happens when we fracture the substrate underneath the ground. So we, we actually go down, we'll drill a well, and in the well casing, there will be holes where little miniature explosions, my friends say, it's like shooting a 30 6 rifle deep in the ground. And the geologists will sniff and see what the best place to put those explosions are. And at the end of the day, if they've done everything right, uh, they get a whole lot of gas out of there. Uh, so much that I'm happy to tell you I'm, I'm pleased as can be. I've got a five-year-old and a five-month-old, and by the time they graduate from high school, I hope that we're energy independent. And that's something I didn't have when I was in their shoes. And, and here we are uh, many years later. Actually, I'm, I'm going to walk down here so I can see this a little better. I want to be able to point, and I'm sorry for the. Oh, okay. I wasn't going to use it, and I apologize. I'm going to get to see more of me. I can't hide. Is that done? Thank you. But uh, in general, when you see that you're not drilling directly below, you're going to have a trespass claim, you're going to have trespass problems. And many of you are familiar with the concept of a slant well, where a mineral owner might have <clears throat> accidentally sent his well at an angle such that the place where he's producing his minerals from is not necessarily adjacent or directly below uh, the surface. So you might be taking minerals out of somebody else's common cup and not out of your own. And the relief for that at, at common law, when this isn't codified, has been that if you did it inadvertently, then you might have to pay royalties, you might have to pay some fees, but you're going to get your expenses back when you produce this other man's mineral. You'll have to pay him for it, but again, it, there, there will be some implication that what you're doing 
uh, is permissible. The, the courts don't come back and put an, an injunction in place or some kind of injunctive relief to stop you from drilling and producing. It's just a matter of balancing, which is interesting because it's more like a multidimensional approach, although we, again, don't really use those terms or haven't yet. Uh, so again, this trespass concept is uh, 600 years of common law uh, that we recognize and we know how to deal with, and unfortunately the changes here have made it complicated. So how do we fix it? How do we avoid these kinds of problems? How do you stop uh, these folks from coming out and saying, you can't be on my property at all. You've crossed over, you've, you've done this, stop, stop now. And the answer really are, is statutory. Uh, lit litigation has been complicated, but again, horizontal drilling statutes, surface damage issue statutes, and pooling can avoid some of these problems. Uh, we're gonna talk about trespass a little more, but I do want to uh, cover permitting. Permitting is a, a keen part of my presentation today, and you're gonna know why in just a minute. But again, state-issued state permits, well permits, they're issued really to promote safety, uniformity, consistency, and each state has to decide. We're, we're a federal republic, we're 50 states, so every state has the unique ability to determine how they wanna do balancing, if at all, or if they wanna go back to a unidimensional approach and say, ah, it's all the mineral company, we wanna drill as much as we can. But the state has the ability to do that and to pull back if they've gone too far to push forward if they haven't gone far enough. So there's some questions that come out of this and some questions that arise. Uh, we'll go through them one at a time and I'm, I'm gonna go kinda fast because I've got a lot to do with you today but I'm happy to talk about these things in detail. Uh, does a state permit sanction process protect a mineral owner from being sued by his landowner? In other words, I am a mineral owner. I go to the state. I, I, I apply for all the proper permits. I have all the right forms. I get my permit. At that point, can the landowner come back and suggest common law trespass or some other nuisance to get me off of the land? And the answer is, as I like to tell people, for uh, you know, 150 bucks and a couple pieces of paper, anybody can sue anybody for anything. And indeed, surface owners have been doing that and challenging these very fundamental concepts. But you know, what's the test? Is there a test? And the answer really is we're back to this multidimensional versus unidimensional approach. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Does a state-issued permit create independent property rights? Now this is important because if the state comes and takes your property rights, it's called a takings. And they have to do so under color of law and they have to compensate you for it. And so the question is, if I give a permit, if, if the issuing agency issues a permit, is that permit a property right that the owner of the surface can say, wait a minute, this has been an unconstitutional takings. Well, the answer is almost always no. And, and sometimes you'll see it on the face of some permits. It'll say right at the bottom, or this does not convey a property right. You'll see it. Sometimes it's in the statute that it doesn't convey it. Um, and it's an interesting issue, and, and you're gonna see why in just a minute as well. I had a case that's integrated all of these so far. Uh, can a state issued permit be reviewed by the courts, meaning I go to my state issuing agency, I get a permit, everything's fine. The owner may have had some opportunity to comment, the owner may have had some opportunity to contest it, but after all that's done, can I, the surface owner, then come back and say, well, I want a judge and a jury of my peers to be the ones who decide whether my argument about reasonability is better than theirs. And in many states, the answer to that is, we don't know. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. States are beginning to address this now because it's very pertinent. And in fact, I'm very grateful to say in West Virginia, November 21st, our Supreme Court uh, ruled specifically that a surface owner cannot challenge the validity of a state issued permit, a well permit in this case, cannot come back in a court and challenge it. This is, seems like a harsh result. Let me explain it to you a little better. The case is Martin v. Hamblett. And in Martin v. Hamblett, <coughs> part of the concern, they said, listen, you." You've got to give us the right to be heard in court. How can you deny us the right to be heard in court? This just doesn't make any sense at all. And the Supreme Court said, well, we're going to look at legislative intent. We're going to look at legislative interpretation. What did the good people of the legislature of West Virginia intend to do? And the answer in this case was that, <clears throat> well, we have a coal statute which covers the exact same issue. And in the coal statute, the owner at the end of the day can challenge the validity of his permit in court. And when the legislature created our statute governing oil and gas, that provision is not in there. And absent an express grant in that statute, our courts will not reach out and create that. So they say the legislature had some reason for saying this applies to coal, but it doesn't apply to oil and gas. <clears throat> now, 
one other argument that comes up in the permitting process is often now landowners are saying, wait, you are giving me a permit that was countenanced in 1978 when all we did were vertical wells, and you've not taken into account that there's all kinds of new technology. We've learned so much. So your permitting process now has to take into account where we stand in current and available technology. It seems to be a reasonable argument sometimes, uh, but again, we're going to defer to issuing agency with respect to that. And if you don't like it, you're going to sue. And I want to thank the good people of the Peace Garden State because this case that I put up here, which is, let's talk about it a little bit, because it's not, Cartech versus EOG Resources, got the citation here, District of North Dakota, came out in 2012. This case quite literally saved my bacon, and I thank you. Uh, I was uh, at the time litigating three cases brought by the same plaintiff's lawyer for three different landowners, all in a very productive part of the Marcellus Formation. In Karch, we had a very similar issue where a landowner had a, a mineral owner came to him and said, we're going to drill a well. He said, I don't want you to drill a well. I don't like it. It's not reasonable use. They fought over the reasonableness of the damages that were being offered. And the courts came back and said, well, first of all, we're not going to cap damages in North Dakota just at fair market value. The legislature has created a system for determining damages here. And frankly, the court said it's a lousy system. There's some ambiguities in it, but I'm not going to reach out and hold the restriction at fair market value because we just don't know. And there, the legislature did a, a good job of creating different categories. But most important for me, and remember we were talking about permitting, uh, was that the court actually held that, and this was the argument, that drill cuttings, and for those of you who are familiar with drilling, the cuttings come out as the uh, drill goes into the ground. Drill cuttings for 100 years have been buried on site at the location of the well. It's something that comes up from the surface owner's property, if you will, deep down. They're pulling it up, and it's buried right there. Well, in Karch, plaintiffs were clever and said, wait a minute. You should be doing a closed loop system. Don't bury anything on the surface. Take it away. Haul it off. Get it out of here. I don't know what's in it. I don't understand it. Don't bury it here. Maybe I'm going to grow crops on it. Who knows what's going to happen? I don't want any of the risk. So don't, don't let them do that. And they did so suing under common law trespass. Well, we just talked about this. So this is a, one of the cases where common law trespass was woven in with permitting. Fascinating. What, what happened is that the court said it is not common law trespass if a mineral owner under color of a state permit is drilling and following the permit requirements with respect to burying drill cuttings. So if the state permit says, you can bury them here, the landowner can't come back and sue and say, well, wait a minute, there are 10 different ways they could handle these as opposed to just burying them here. It doesn't matter. It's not trespass. The case wouldn't even stand. You can't move forward with it. Well, these were two of my three cases. The first one settled. These two are now both pending before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And I am happy to say that Judge Fred Stamp of the Northern District of West Virginia bought Karch hook, line, and sinker and made it a dispositive issue. And in West Virginia, at least in the Northern District, that's how our courts are ruling. Same thing. Can't claim trespass damages if, in this case, the person who's on the property and who's extracting the minerals is doing so under the color of a permit. This is a fun case. I'm going to give you guys just a little, a little breakdown. I'm, I'm happy to talk about this case for hours. It consumed a, a large, uh, or these cases for hours. It, they consumed a great degree, a uh, great deal of my time. And it's kind of fun because the owners did some interesting things here. We're going to get to it. But the owners sued. They said the same thing. You can't bury these drill cuttings. It's just wrong. We don't know anything about what's going in there. And there were ownership interests. These folks filed a suit. They only owned, well, at the time, they owned 330 seconds of the surface. And it was held in common with relatives. And during discovery, they bought everybody else's interests. And didn't tell anybody. Certainly didn't tell my client, who had been properly paying the people they thought owned the surface for surface damages, pursuant to West Virginia Surface Damages Act. You can imagine our shock when we uh, were talking to them in deposition, had the privilege of deposing all of the people involved in these, to find out that indeed none of the other people owned any of it. So it changed things a bit, but more importantly, there were some privacy issues that were unique to these cases. Uh, there was some damage to animals. We're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, they claimed the freshwater pits were not properly reclaimed. Uh, that's a freshwater pit right there. And what they said was, you shouldn't have lined it. If you were going to line it, then you got to get what's in there out because you wouldn't have lined it if you didn't believe that what you were putting in there wasn't bad. And also they claimed that the, the property afterwards, there was actually a chain link fence around the freshwater pit in question. This is from one of the other cases. And 
they actually allege, we deny it, this was never determined on the merits, uh, that they folded the chain link fence down into the pond and then just covered it over with, uh, with uh, backfill, which isn't appropriate and not permitted, but again, we didn't reach that level because they didn't have the right to sue under trespass, thanks to Karch. But in addition, let me make this go back, in addition to that, they said, and this is important, you're burying things here that you took from somebody else as well. And indeed, at least on one occasion, it appears that the records show that they had buried drill cuttings from another property nearby into a pit that they had dug on this property. Generally, ex ex with the exception of some express permission to do so, that's not permissible. You should be burying your own things on the area where you're permitted, either by express agreement, deed, easement, or some other reason to do so. Uh, but, but again, uh, that was a minor issue. The plaintiffs in this case were really looking to make new law in West Virginia, or at least to come to grips with the law and suggest that, indeed, trespass is still an available remedy. And they brought up all kinds of fun things. They said, my gosh, what are you putting in these pits? No one really knows. DEP, and that's our De Department of Environmental Protection in West Virginia, they don't know. Uh, they suggested maybe all the frac fluids are dangerous. That's it. And the drilling muds contain hydrocarbons. They were stunned. They said, oh, we can't believe there are hydrocarbons in the drilling muds. I, you drill down to a hydrocarbon producing strata, you're going to get volatiles. They're going to come up with the stuff. But in any event, uh, there was a lot of fight over that. And finally, they brought up radiation. You're digging up radioactive rock and then burying it on the surface. And there's a lot of new litigation out there about background level radiation. And this is an interesting and new issue because a lot of states and those who handle the permitting haven't addressed it. To their credit, all of their evidence was based on anecdotal information. They didn't do any scientific testing. They used the MSDS, the material safety data sheets, for things like drill mud and frac fluid and said, well, th there's benzene in this list. Therefore, you put benzene on my land. You've got to get the benzene off. Benzene is never reasonable, never reasonable for you to deposit that, no matter what the state permit issuing agency says. Can't do it. Uh, and they relied on color, which is interesting. Our ground's supposed to be red. You put a bunch of black junk in there. That black junk doesn't make sense. Now, we, they said, we don't know what's in that black junk. It's migrating. It's going everywhere. Who knows what's in it? You don't know what's in it. The state doesn't know what's in it. Therefore, the only remedy is for you to remove it all and carry it off in a closed-loop system. Hello. Again, you know, you know exactly why Karch saved my bacon. It was the same case decided uh, many hours and many miles away. So was this a permitted disposal? Uh, and this actually is, a, this is not a reclaimed uh, pit, obviously. Uh, it wouldn't have been left in that condition. If you remember earlier, I mentioned that there are other damages they claim. <clears throat> I will call them extraordinary damages. They claim, first of all, that, uh, well, at one occasion, they claimed that the neighbor's dog went into a freshwater pit and got trapped, swam around for a couple of hours, and the next day lost all of his hair on his body, except for on his head and his tail. And it stayed that way for three months. Now, they, they, did not pre they didn't proffer any evidence about this. It was just testimonial. They didn't give it to me in written discovery. It only came up at a deposition. And it was quite interesting to hear that. Now, this dog, I understand, is designed to look this way. Don't let me lead you to believe that this somehow is the dog in question. It is not. Uh, but second thing, and, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute why I think it was important for them to have this kind of stuff in there. Second thing, and, and pardon me for not being tactful necessarily, but they claimed literally that contractors from the mineral owner had been defecating in the yard near the dwelling and had been doing so specifically to irritate or anger the landowner. And they said, oh, you, got, you need to put in porta potties. You have to do it. And if you don't do it, because these guys are doing it. Again, this is anecdotal evidence. They didn't, this wasn't decided on the merits. No one had to determine, indeed, were contractors out there defecating. But these salacious kind of details, this hairless dog, this porta potty these are interesting. They're salacious. They're sexy. They make the newspapers cover it more. And so you want to make new law. You want to argue that trespass at common law ought to be kicked out here or ought to be preserved here. Let's throw in a hairless dog. <laughs> Let's throw in a porta potty now. And it literally, the testimony of these people, in a way, was compelling. I mean, the, when, I, when I deposed the, uh, the wife, she said, I remember the day that my son was out walking in the yard and came back with human waste on his foot and brought it all through the house. And nobody wants a jury to hear this stuff, no matter how well codified our laws are about what's reasonable. Nobody does. Uh, so my question is, where is it going to end? I mean, are we going to live in a world where we have to deal with hairless dogs and porta potty analogies? 
And that's the great question. In fact, uh, our modest response in, in Lori's excellent paper is uh, really a litigation versus legislation. I say choose your own adventure. You, you get to make the decision. Do you want to have all this argued in court or do you want to have uh, your state legislatures make very comprehensive laws that cover these issues? And don't get me wrong, I don't think anybody out there suggests that uh, if you have a freshwater pit and it literally causes a dog's hair to fall off, or if you're defecating in a yard, that those are reasonable uses of the property. No one's going to argue that. But with respect to everything else we can handle, the common law will do a good job of handling the hairless dog. The common law does not do a good job of really balancing the interest between a surface and a mineral land. So uh, again, there are three basic types of statutes that I want to talk about. Uh, there are more. There are more interesting. There are other things out there. We're going to restrict it to these. Uh, surface damage statutes, which literally cover, and most of them, as Lori uh, stated, were designed at a time period when vertical drilling uh, was the norm and the industry standard. So, uh, and then secondly, horizontal drilling statutes, which take into account all of those unique things we've been showing you and talking about that relate to horizontal and not drilling applications. And finally, pooling and missing air statutes. So allowing the mineral owner to combine areas of mineral ownership so that they can efficiently pull minerals without pockets being left behind, without dissenters stopping everything. So uh, another interesting fact of legislation, it really has the ability to address some of these technological issues faster than the, the justice system. And I know some, I've had people say to me, well, that's not true. I file a, a lawsuit in court and the judge can make a decision about it right then. What we found is that judges tend to fall back on the unidimensional approach that they learned in law school and that they've dealt with their whole lives. And it's a comfortable place for a judge to be. And so we end up in a position where if you will allow a legislature to give a lot of these rulemaking decisions over to a state agency and protect them, that these agencies can have the kind of public comment period. They can be attentive to what really is industry standard. They can deal with these things much better than a judge who might see one of these cases every couple of years or who might have 50 of these cases on his docket and, and is absolutely unable to distinguish them. <clears throat> again, I, I pointed out here, again, I'm not trying to get rid of, we're not, no one's trying to get rid of the common law rights. I don't want the hairless dog. Uh, what do surface owner, owner damage statutes do? Well, they compensate the surface owners for drilling and for operations. Um, almost all of them say, we're going to preserve your common law rights to sue if the if the behavior exceeds the permitted activity, not what's reasonable, I'm not going to talk about reasonability for that, it's just going to be whether the behavior exceeds the permit, uh, there'll be a notification of process, the opportunity to make claims, many of them allow for uh, mineral owners to go ahead and make an offer, and North Dakota does, I'll talk about it again in a minute here. Uh, and then some of them provide for legal action if that doesn't work, some as you know now in West Virginia, doesn't provide for legal action if you're not happy with it. Uh, and the legislature has the ability to go back and, and, and correct that and fix it. Nine states have enacted some kind of comprehensive surface owner damage statutes. Uh, again, many of those are going to be limited to the vertical notions and vertical technology. So some of that is not as useful as we'd like it to be, but I'm glad to see that we have nine states that are behind this. Uh, and some states, in addition to the nine, and you all have noticed, of course, that North Dakota has been in both categories so far, uh, have also enacted specific legislation with respect to horizontal drilling. And we expect to see more of that. In fact, more of that is coming through. And especially in, let's say, states like New York, which have, through a regulatory agency, put a moratorium on fracking, we expect to see the legislature to have to address that and make some hard decisions about what they want to do to affect all the people in the state. Horizontal drilling statutes, of course, very unique. They can handle horizontal issues. Uh, they, can, they can adjust themselves as horizontal technologies change. And again, you can have public comment sessions that are, frankly, more open than just having a lawsuit filed in some remote county somewhere. Uh, this is the public interest paragraph, if you will, for North Dakota's horizontal damages statute section. Uh, from North Dakota Century Code. I'm actually going to show you, I'm going to highlight certain words of this in a minute, but uh, this is public interest. There are important words here to see. It's in the public interest to encourage, foster, promote development of these minerals, and there's all kinds of reasons here. We're going to go through it. Uh, but I, So you know, and Lori touched on this a bit, but in the past, the mineral owner, he had to compensate the surface owner only for extraordinary or unreasonable damages. Otherwise, it was back to the concept 
this unidimensional approach. Frankly, North Dakota's surface damages statute is more of a multidimensional approach, and it was designed to be. It's designed to try to balance the interests of the surface owner with the mineral owner. And provides for two specific types of surface damage, damages and disruption, and loss of production. This is all codified. And you can see it's for lost land value, loss, use of, a uh, loss of use, access to surface owner's land, lost value of improvements, and then loss of production. Uh, if you certainly can't use some of your, let me tell you, it's an interesting dis dis for me to distinguish this. In West Virginia, on many of these places, if you want to get a, a five acre parcel to drill your Marcellus or your horizontal well on, it might be the only five acres of flat spot in the surface owner's property. I understand that that is not as much of a concern here in North Dakota. You can probably find a place to put a well, but often a person will say, that's my only pasture. You can't use my only pasture. And so please appreciate that topography and geography have a lot to do with this as well, which is again why state-specific legislatures can address that. All 55 of our counties are mountainous, and we take that into concern when we pass legislation that affects the entire state. So does the statute adequately protect surface owners? I'll show you these highlighted portions. I read you the first part, or I paraphrased it, but it's to protect the rights of all owners. Well, that sounds multidimensional, doesn't it? Not just the mineral owner. So that, but here's for what, this is the catch, the greatest possible economic recovery of natural resources be obtained. It doesn't say protect all owners so that there's the least amount of disturbance on the surface. Well, they, they could have put that in there, but they didn't. So suddenly, what seems like something that's multidimensional also seems to have sort of a unidimensional approach because no matter how you shake a stick at it, we are vital natural resources is what we really care about. It's going back to the mineral. And I will say that the statute is far more balanced than some. Um, in North Dakota, the mineral owner has to come to you and make an offer for what he thinks the value of the surface disturbance will be pursuant to the statute. If you disagree with it, you may sue him in court. If you lose, or more appropriately, if the amount of your surface disturbance is deemed to be less than the amount he offered you in the first place, there's a fee shifting provision and attorney's fees and other costs may be recovered. So if, you, if a man comes to you and offers you $20,000, you might want to think, you might want to find out how close is this to what it ought to be before you reject it and before you make him spend $50,000 to beat you in court and you have to write him a check. Uh, finally, pooling statutes. Uh, pooling statutes are wonderful. In West Virginia, we don't have forced pooling. Uh, we do have some law that suggests if there's already a lease in place, you might be able to write a pooling agreement into it, uh, but there's nothing that would provide for a, a pooling agreement if there's no lease already in place. Uh, states that have enacted forced pooling can literally come through and say to you, I appreciate that you have mineral rights, and we're going to get that stuff out of there. And you will be paid for it. You'll receive compensation. However, we're going to deduct our costs just like we would if you had an agreement with us. And it forces mineral owners to think outside their own box, and to think about the interest of the community, to think about the interest of the state, and to think about the fact that it's important for North Dakota, West Virginia, and the United States to, drink, to pull these minerals out of the ground. But again, finally, it's a choose your own adventure. If a state doesn't feel like it wants to have this kind of statutory, it, they don't have to. And you can have a lot of hairless dogs, and you can have the porta potty legislation. That, 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 that litigation is not going to stop. And, and maybe it shouldn't with respect to some of those things, but as long as a plaintiff's attorney can say, I want to challenge the fundamental rubric of our law, and meanwhile, I've got some pretty salacious facts I can throw in, they're going to do that, and they're going to keep doing it. A and again, I don't want people who have real injury not to have relief, but there's a difference between relief for the purpose of handling someone and a relief system that shuts down the development of minerals altogether. I think we have a little time for questions. I'm going to come back up here with Lori. <clears throat> have either of you uh, ever had any situations where you have um, a, a surface owner that's got a really large surface estate that basically uh, exceeds by a long way your uh, uh, spacing unit and pooled area, um, and basically they're using, maybe they may not own minerals, and they're using their, maybe it would be like a large 10,000-acre ranch or something like that, and they're using their, uh, surface ownership, and it's in a really rural area outside of that spacing unit, to uh, basically block your access into 
the well site and prevent you from developing your minerals. Any, uh, any situations like that or, uh, you know, can you make any comments on something like that? I'll start off by saying that I don't know of any 10,000 acre properties that I've handled again. We, <laughs> thank you. I, wrong, wrong part of the country, but, but yes, I mean, we, we certainly, uh, we see, certainly see people trying to block access to wells. That's something that's litigated often. We have lots of situations where people will go and, and not just file actions in court, but this is where you knock down the three trees and block the road, or you put a chain across the road. And in, our, in my part of the world, in, in my practice, I've seen some of our mineral owners be very aggressive. We'll go and seek injunctive relief if we think the landowner is being unreasonable or is attempting to prevent our access or use of the property. So we're, we're incredibly active about handling those types of problems. But Yeah, I agree with John on that. And, and one thing that you have to keep in mind, on just on Tuesday before I flew out here on Wednesday to North Dakota, I had an injunction action for a client. It was a uh, gentleman who owns a piece of property that my client had a lease on, surface owner. He was trying to basically hold them hostage, saying, give me $30,000 in advance or I won't sign a surface use agreement or, you know, you can't come on my property. So that's what he did. We were proactive about it. We sued him. We, uh, I went into court. You know, I knew that really th it was all about money. He hired an attorney, came into court, um, you know, he was like, you're taking my only pasture, it's the same thing, you know, same, same type of argument that we had, that, that we were talking about earlier. But, um, you know, the first thing that I said, it was on a motion for preliminary injunction, the first thing I said to the court is I said, you know, we shouldn't even be here right now. This man has, this is all about damages, this is all about money. You don't litigate that in the front. We have the right to get on his property to drill our well. We've got a surface owner's compensation statute in place in West Virginia. He has a remedy. After this is all over, after we've drilled, after it's been reclaimed, if he wants to make a claim, if he doesn't think what we're going to pay him is adequate, then that is his remedy. You can't take it on yourself to stop people from coming on your land, especially for issues like this. And, and the judge agreed with me wholeheartedly and said, and issued an order saying, do not interfere with their access, we'll deal with this stuff later. And that's important because I think a lot of times, you know, you fall into the trap of, you know, let's go in there and let's talk about these damages. Is this his only pasture, is it not? Who cares? We've got the right to reasonable use. And in that particular case, we were actually drilling, my company has a gas, natural gas storage field, reservoir under, that flows underneath this property and uh, we were going to drill through that storage field down to another strata. It was just a vertical well, too. It wasn't a horizontal well that we were talking about. But, you know, um, it was, you know, they had to get in there. As far as being able to show irreparable harm, which is required for an injunction, you know, a lot of times you have difficulty with that because if it's something that can be reimbursed by money, then really it's not considered irreparable. But in this particular case, there was only a certain time period in which my company could drill this well, and that was between like February and May, because at that time the storage pool, the pressure goes down because of all the gas that had gone out of there during the winter from people heating their homes and using gas. So there was only like a two month period that we had there that we could drill. And I, you know, we used that in support of our irreparable harm argument and the court took it. But again, if you've got a surface use compensation statute in your, you know, that's been passed by your legislature and somebody tries to keep you off of the property because of these issues regarding damage and money and stuff like that, the judges should throw it out right away and say, come back when it's done and we'll talk about it. Let them get their drilling complete. Okay, my question is slightly different. Um, so if you've got a gas pipeline that you're trying to construct in eight miles, from the wellhead to the the other the larger pipeline, and you've got landowners for seven miles of it that are have a you know written got, got an agreement signed, but you've got one holdout farmer, and uh, then you're trying to go make a, a loop around it, and, and he's convinced everybody else. Is is that somewhat related? Are there some rights to yeah. get that thing? This has been in litigation for six years. Is it I mean, is the lease, is the unit all underneath of this 
Are you talking about a horizontal well? Or no, the, 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 the land is over the here. Pipeline right away? Is that what you're talking about? What's that? Pipe, pipeline right pipeline away? Pipeline right away, yeah. Yeah, um, and you don't have the power of eminent domain, right? You're not talking I don't about think so. transmission company. Well, if you don't, I mean, the, the right, the mineral owner has the right to reasonable use above that for the surface or if you've got a pool unit. Right? But you have to go across yeah. other people's land to get to the other transmission yeah. line. Yeah, no, I understand. So that you're, you're screwed. Yeah, you kind of are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to tell you that. <laughs> That's right. Everybody's got a price. They do. If you have the power of eminent domain, which I'm several of my clients do because they, they are uh, natural gas companies that deal with uh, <coughs> residential gas service, then that's another issue. And, you know, when they're trying to, they always try to go out and negotiate pipeline right away agreements with folks. And if they're not able to, then we can go into court and take it. Um, and that's what we do. And we pay just compensation for that. But unfortunately, production companies don't have that right of eminent domain. And dealing, I mean, landowners can be difficult. It's it's ridiculous. I had a case in Pennsylvania where they were replacing a uh, a service line that was across some guy's property, and uh, they, in order to replace it, they, in to keep the continuous flow of gas throughout there, they laid the new line next to the old line. Then they, you know, when the new line's laid, they disconnect the old line and connect the new line, and then they leave the other pipe in the ground. Well. The uh, landowner just threw a fit. He's like, you know, you're not going to, that's two pipelines on my property, even though there wasn't any natural gas flowing through the old one. It was just going to be abandoned, which was the procedure. But anyway, they, we agreed to dig the pipeline up, and then he took us back into court because we didn't move the second line. Okay, you, you had the old line here, the new line here. Because we laid it parallel to the old line, and connected it up and didn't move it back over here, you know, two feet or whatever, that was a continuing trespass. And he was so damaged, you know, because of that. It's just, you know, you're dealing with some people that, you know, some people that you deal with are really easy to deal with and they're very reasonable. But you're going to, no matter what you're doing, you're going to run into unreasonable people who don't want you to be out there. Another client of mine had a well on a property in Pennsylvania and the landowner kept uh, showing up in the woods naked. <laughs> Just <laughs> I didn't use that slide. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. <laughs> That's a good segue into the next question, though. No. <laughs> uh, That's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> this is a little bit off, but it has to do with how far can you take the reasonable use doctrine or the reasonable accommodation doctrine, because you get an oil well where the population uh, uh, moves into the area, and it's noisy and may you know, and it be, then it becomes a disturbance in the neighborhood. Do you deal with those? I know that's probably off topic here, but what rights do uh, uh, producers have, uh, and what what do they what do they do they have the right of the permit to rely on the va on the permitting process to stay there, even though it's you know I, I, modern technology might m make some of these noise abatement uh, opportunities uh, expensive but available. And w what are what's happening in that area? Well, first and foremost, there is generally a concern of the law that we call coming to the nuisance. If you move next door to a sewage treatment plant, you can't then begin complaining about the smell of sewage. So that's a fundamental common law doctrine that, that often defeats a lot of those. 